All right, hi. My name is Alia DeAngelis. So I'm going to take my, my DevOps days hat off. And I'm going to tell you a tiny, tiny bit about me and why this is really interesting to me. So I tried to say it nicely in my descriptive thing, right, what this really is. I know, he's like, it wasn't nice. There is a seat, well, I don't think that's a seat, over there. So the reason that this is a particularly interesting topic to me is I work with collaboration. And the reason why I started working with collaboration really did originate from when I was a small child. My grandmother is a Jew, and she is from Haifa in Israel. And she met a very, very handsome man named Clifford Hussein, uh, to be specific, Clifford Hussein Faris Al Qasim, that is the tribe that we are from. And he is Muslim. He's uh, not Arab. We are Samaritan. And he is from Karaun in Lebanon. And they fell in love in the 1920s and did a lot of illegal stuff like fake birth certificates and all kinds of things, pretending to convert to Judaism. There were no civil marriages. And they married. She was only 16 and had to lie and say she was 17. Her parents ripped their clothing and never spoke to her again. Um, because this is the 1920s, right? And so I would hear this story as a child. I didn't understand why my grandmother read backwards, right, Hebrew. And um, I got yelled at in about three languages, escalating up to Yiddish, which is when it got really bad. And other than that, it was Hebrew and Arabic. But as I learned about those conflicts, I didn't know why they kept fighting. I didn't know why we called... Uh, Israel to see if family was okay, and then Lebanon to see if family was okay, each bombing, right, not knowing. And then I lived there. I lived on the Golan, uh, woke up to shelling many, many, many times, F-15s hovering, and then even though they're not supposed to, and jumping out of the mountain, the ground shaking, and I was like, These, this is my family. These are my tribes. And so that was really interesting in my young 20s, and then I started... Uh, my career in uh, medical and cultural anthropology with pre-med. And now I really consider myself a corporate anthropologist. And I chose IT because it did have good opportunities for people with uh, my body style, which would be called feminine. And so that's how I landed here. Well, sometimes I get tired of saying I'm a woman because that's obvious too. But collaborating was really interesting to me. And, the, and I got to train with David Spann. I don't know if you know any of you know who he is, but he was up at the Agile Manifesto helping to facilitate that. And as I started practicing and being self-aware of what it was that I was bringing to the table, I started really, there was one day, and many of you may have heard the story, when I, it hit me what collaboration truly was. And I actually, I was in the hallway at my house downstairs, and I don't know why it hit me, but I just started to weep. And I realized this isn't like who moved my cheese. The true collaboration in the agile world meant that I actually had to change. And I didn't actually know if I had the courage. Because I had a lot of baggage. You know, I, we all do. Uh, and for some crazy reason, I call, I call this the trail of tears. And I chose it. And it means that I face me on the path every day. But then I found that as I faced me and could negotiate my own self, all of a sudden my teams changed. And all of a sudden I got really weird good. And then all of a sudden I didn't have to do a whole lot. And the teams were fine and they performed really high and it didn't matter my JIRA. And it didn't you know, matter whether I was doing DSDM or Scrum or XP. And I didn't get it. And someone came to me, Tamara, for those of you who've worked at In Contact, her name's Tamara. She sat me down and said, it's you, Alia. There's something about you that's different. So I've been observing that for the last three years. And I didn't have good words. And then I took what's called an authentic leadership program. Uh, are any of you familiar with that out of Naropa University in Boulder? You don't have to get stoned to go there because, you know, some people don't, just saying. <laughs> she laughs. You know what I'm talking about, right? You walk around, you're like, for reals. Um, I'm not a judger, though. So I bumped into a book called Collaborating with the Enemy. Have you, any of you heard that, of that book? Okay. So it's by Adam Kahane. Thank you, thank you, thank you. By Adam Kahane. 
And Adam Kahane really said what I was feeling. And then we're going to, well, hopefully jump into why you're here. So while I'm talking, I'm going to ask you to multitask, which is probably stupid. But think about what it is you want to get from this. And we're going to go around and group into small groups and say, this is what I'm hoping to get out of this. And then we'll pick one or two to share. Because that's just as valuable, right? Why are, this is a lot of people here. Um, this is lots, and I think it's fabulous, but it tells me we're all wondering, how do we help when people don't want to collaborate or when that person who should collaborate is not going to collaborate, what do we do? Adam Kahane deals with real issues. So he does ethnic cleansings, and he deals with drug lords and uh, entire countries needing to revolutionize or actually just get along with each other, meaning this country and this country. So how many of you, by raise of hand, know about team agreements? Okay, raise them high. Can someone tell me what a team agreement is and why? So a team agreement is a set of rules that the team set for themselves so that as they are doing their work, they know whether they're operating together or off doing their own thing. Correct. So did you guys all hear that? Set of agreements that you all kind of, uh, you make collaboratively so that you know kind of how to regulate with one another. So team agreements that Adam Kahane, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just check my math that he's done. Have you ever had a team agreement that is, no guns in the collaboration room? Not yet. No. How about you can't kill one another for things they said while collaborating? No. No. So these are the kind of team agreements that he has because he's really dealing with people who would murder one another if that wasn't a team agreement. But it actually prevents people from truly hurting each other. In fact, one little thing I'll share with you um, is he was working with some drug lords in Cali, Colombia. We all know about those, uh, that situation, or maybe you don't, the cocaine wars. And they'd been trying to kind of, Colombia was falling apart, so they brought together some of the leadership in these drug cartels to kind of stop killing each other. And um, one of the main guys from one cartel made a mistake, and something went down, and so his murder was ordered. And uh, the other guy, the other main guy that had been in the collaboration room and knew the guy's intent. So Vital Smarts, Emily talked about intent. He actually knew the intent and knew that it, it was a mistake. Could have been killed for doing this, but he went to the head of the cartel. He was his number two. And he said, don't, don't kill him. It was a mistake. Here's what happened. Here's the context. Can we just talk through it? And uh, he, they did. They did. And it it led to some peace and it led to a change in the way the cartels navigated with one another. So I think if like that high of a stake could, could be successful, uh, we could do it too. So moving on to that, collaboration is important to me because I just want my family uh, to maybe stop bombing one another and I'm not sure that I'll ever participate in that type of a, a level of can the Jews <laughs> in the Middle East and the the Muslims stop killing each other. So if you see me on national news in 20 years, you'll know that that was my ultimate goal, but we'll see how that goes. For now, I'm just going to tackle technology. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's do this. Let's just literally group into like either threes or fours, just super quick. And I want you to turn to one another. And I know this is going to be hard. So this is going to be your group for the next. No, it's OK. We're looking for people who are different. I love you, Jenny. OK, I didn't know if she was sad. Oh, she's my friend. I shouldn't pick on her. Thank you, participant. So quickly, group, and what I want you to do is share what you're hoping to get out. Like, why are you here? Does that make sense? You guys look like you had a compelling, uh, a compelling conversation as well. Let's see if we. This is a lot. Of, right. All right. So we're going to share like one thing from each group, um, or you can do two. So I guess uh, Mike. Why, what do you hope to get out of this session? Oh, I, what I had said was that I work in a really high performing team right now, but our company is constantly moving us around and breaking up teams, reassembling. And what I would like to do is learn how to build that collaboration uh, environment quicker so that I enjoy it all the time. Okay. Yeah, not just, they, they throw you into some of the Tuckman's model, right? Where you go back into forming, storming, norming, and performing. How'd I do, boss? Boom. Do you want to teach? I'm out. You guys. Sure. Um, that's a tough one. Um, I, I guess what mostly I wanted to get a little bit of balance in my 
my own self, I guess. I, I'm, I'm, I, can, I can tend to cause a lot of conflict with my words, and I don't think about them enough, I suppose. And to be able to you know, get a little more well-rounded. I love that. You guys, so what he just did right there is, was an invitation into vulnerability. Can I repeat what you said, just in case people didn't hear it? What he said is, I tend to create conflict. And so I, I just want to understand if there are better words or a better way, right? It's really hard when you're the one who dissents and everybody wants to kumbaya and maybe you don't actually say it right because you're reacting because it's scary or you're upset. You're like, they're going to freak out on me. But if I don't say this, like the servers are crashing down, right? So that's very vulnerable. Thank you. Here. <laughs> she just asked me what the question was. I love you, Jenny. So the question is, why are you here? What do you guys hope to learn? Just one thing. Just one thing. Just one thing. She knows I talk too much. Um, I lead up a team of database engineers that sits with the application development teams they support. And so I, I'm just worried about collaboration among the database engineers as well as um, between all the teams because sometimes we make decisions that affect all the teams. So here we are making these decisions and it could cascade out and that probably causes some issues, but how do you collaborate to include all of the different voices but not get stuck and also not mess up your own flow? How to do? Right. Ah, ha, ha. <laughs> I've been that person. Uh, here. I may need to ask because there's such a large group. Maybe I'll have you guys raise your hand, like who would want to share? Because I think it might take a little while. Okay, he, we're going to do him and then you. So I work with the organization of around 300 people, and we're pretty aligned on where we're trying to get to, continuous deployment, et cetera, good DevOps things. But we have a, an organization within that of around 80 people that really fiercely want to be independent in how they get there, run their own tools, build their own tools, make their own decisions. So trying to lead through that. So if I were going to parrot that back, a lot of people passionate with the vision, but individual contributors with individual tracks, but not saying we're a group collaborative team. And so you can't all just be individuals because that's like one finger clapping. Right? How to do? Light, did you want to share? Um, I'm hoping to get better out of it. Um, how to better build collaborative goals. So a big vision that an entire team can unify against, or unify behind, that is not one person's vision that the team was working to build, but everyone's equal part contri contribution to design the end goal. Yeah. So, right, so how do we get all the ideas out, have a collaborative goal, it be the right goal, and we all align to it and try it, and then not make anybody super mad, or if they're mad, there's always the employee assistance program. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> I'm so rude and sassy. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, were you volunteering, or was that a chicken thing on your head? Uh, breaking the ice on the collaboration. Once collaboration begins, they have a degree of momentum that can continue, but breaking the ice can be difficult. Oh, yeah. How to get it going, how to create that safety. Hey, why isn't anybody talking about the second part of your, your title, kale with kids? Oh, yeah, how to get your kids to eat kale. Do you want, he wants his kids to eat kale. I'm going to answer that one first because that's the easiest one for me, and then we'll di dive right on into the next section. Uh, all you have to do is you cook the kale into like sauces, and then you blend it in like a blend tech or something. If no, you can't do too much. It's gross. Then they never know. If you put carrots in there too, then it sweetens it. All natural. They don't know they're eating kale. I'm just saying. You can. <laughs> they will never know. Okay, so that... Second half of the title is done, right? That's how you get your kids to eat kale. You make chips out of them, and you put enough oil on them. They're just fabulous. He can sleep. He said he can sleep. All right, drop the mic. So lots of different questions about how do we collaborate. And I keep hitting this with my chin, and I knocked it off, so I don't know what I'm going to do with it. But um, how do we get to collaboration? So the first thing is, where do you think we start? Anybody, just quick raise a hand. Where would you start with collaboration? Meetings, communication, trust, what? Defining an end goal. Didn't you have your hand raised? You did. Oh, what was it? Getting together. Thank you, yeah. 
defining the outcomes, aligning them. Right, so why do we even want to collaborate in the first place? Yeah. Thank you. Evaluating our model. Evalu so I, I would start there. So what is my motive? Why do I want to collaborate? And I bring it there because people sniff that out. They will sniff out why you want to collaborate. This is not mine, so I'm just going to set that over there. They will sniff it out, and they will know if you're going to manipulate them. You know. Just think about it really fast. Think about a time when you were called into a conversation. It could be with your mom or your dad or your sister or your friend or a doctor or uh, a coworker, anybody. Just think for a hot minute of a time you were called into convo and you were like, this is not the reason I'm here. <laughs> there is another agenda. So just I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Feel that in your body, by the way. What I want you to do is feel it in your physical self. Anybody, where do you feel it in your body? Tension. Anyone else? Stomach, dread. But where do you feel it physically in your body? You know it. Right, you trust that. Who else? Where do you guys feel it? Who feels it right here? Note what it feels like. Our bodies have some mirror neurons. There's some debate about that, right? But you have mirror neurons. So you can sense when somebody is there with a certain intent. Now what I want you to do is I want you to think of a time when you were called into a conversation and it looked like it was GDFR, right? Going down for real. That's one of my favorite things, flow rider. And it was actually, ends up being really beautiful. Like you, you approach that person and you went, oh, huh, it looks, it looks serious, but I'm okay. We had that yesterday. It, it's because we know each other from somewhere else. Um, so I want you to think of that time real quick. But I want you to feel that in your body and where you feel that. So 30 seconds, no jeopardy. Okay, that might not be 30 seconds, but where do you feel that? Yeah. In your core, in here. What is it? What temperature? What, what, what temperature would that be? Kind of a heat. Okay. Anyone else? <laughs> Poor Bill, I keep looking at him. It's not fair when you have friends in the crowd. Joseph. Where do you feel it? Well, what about when something is right? So I'm going to, because it's hard to hear, because again, we're really a much larger group than I had anticipated, so I apologize. But what he's saying is they are different. So when, it's like not quite butterflies, but it feels good and different. Do you feel tense or do you feel open, calming? Now, not all of you have, what did you say? It's like sunshine. An aha moment. An aha moment. Like, yeah, <laughs> like that. Do you want to put a post-it note up there? So I think, so note the difference in your own body. When you are the giver, so I know that this is possibly exactly what you were, you were hoping to hear about collaboration, but collaboration cannot be forced because that's manipulation and it's a lie. And it, it is what it is. You will have to coerce somebody. You will have to convince somebody. So when Emily's talking about safety and the gentleman is talking about uh, the airport thing, it's really going into yourself and checking in my body, in my physiology, right, because we're all mammals. You didn't know you were going to get like a bio, neurobio class. Well, that, that's what this might just be. So you're, you feel it in your body and note the difference. Everyone's going to feel it a little bit differently, but trust your body. And before you walk in to even have that meeting or make that agenda or create the mission, step back and ask yourself, what's my intent? And I'll be quite frank with you. Right now I have a gig where... Um, they don't get a choice. 
there is no choice. This is not collaborative, and I'm sorry. You're going to lose your money. So we have to set this up this way. I'll do my best to let you be self-forming, but you're, you're going to lose all your funding. And actually, they delivered yesterday. That was their due date, and they nailed it. I was on stage there somewhere else, and they did just fine. But they were really mad because I took the collaboration away, but they weren't away, but they weren't actually collaborating. They were actually just yelling at each other. and criti Yeah, they were doing this. They were criticizing each other. But I took it away, and I said, we will collaborate going forward. And I created new collaboration places for them. But when it came to what they kind of had to do, they kind of had to do it. But I was honest about it. I walked up. I was not going to manipulate them. And I said, here's the deal. This is going to feel like crap, and I apologize. But you're going to lose your funding, so here's the structure I'm putting. Now, May 16th, we'll talk about it, and we'll change. So I apologize. It feels yucky. Please keep me posted if it gets really awful yucky. And then we'll address it. And they were like, ah, OK. But I wasn't trying to be like, look, it's collaboration. But it's not. It's like a poison pill. So just for a minute, turn back into these groups and talk about times you have come with a clear intent and how that has moved the discussion forward. Because that is the beginning of collaboration is who you are and where you're at. And sometimes I have a headache. And sometimes I don't feel well. And sometimes I'm in a foul mood. <laughs> it happens. And sometimes I actually just don't want to listen to you. And <laughs> it happens. So turn back to those groups. Just take a few minutes and talk about, again, just a time. Celebrate a moment when you showed up with clear intent. Even if the clear intent was too bad. <laughs> OK? All right, go. Raise your hand if this was a little hard for you. Just this activity, this conversation. I'm going to pick on him, and I'm going to pick on you guys, because I know him. Uh, what about it was a challenge, if you don't mind? I just couldn't think of a good example. OK, couldn't, just couldn't think of a good example. So sometimes you may not even know, and you're like, Isaac's a very gentle soul. So he just kind of would be like, OK, I understand. So you may just be kind of second nature, and I'm not trying to be nice, because we know I'm not gratuitous. He knows I'm not nice. Do you guys? To talk through it, yeah. And this is a weird question to ask, right? Because the question is, how do I show up? How am I physiologically and neurolo neurologically showing up? Not do I have my agenda, do I have my goals, is it all delineated out? And that's usually what our bosses or maybe Harvard Business School may teach us. But what the question really is, is what am I neurologically bringing to the situation and I, I'm sure some of this is going to be a little bit uh, repeat from last year or the year before. But uh, they have done research on people called startled research. Uh, it's a startled research where they shoot a gun or a, a sound of a gun, and you, they see if people startle or not, and how long the startle lasts, and how long the spike in the neurology lasts. And so the question is all around, uh, can they calm themselves down quickly? And what they find is, is the calmest person in the room um, has a heavy duty influence on the rest of the people being calm. Because they will quickly spike and then match that person's neurology. If you're interested in that research, I can offline that way with you. But that is using an fMRI and a few other EEG machines and other stuff that uh, is out of, I believe, Wisconsin and the Mindsight Institute. So keeping, knowing how you show up as the leader, I don't always want to have my back to you guys is really important. So what I'm asking you is, how did you show up? And rather than focusing on the not so great, because we all have lots of examples on that, I wanted you to focus on, how did, when did I show up in a really good present space, an honest space, right, wrong, or indifferent, for what was just about to go down? Like, you could be having to say you're all fired. Right? And that happens. But the space that you were in affects the neurology of everybody else. So when we're talking collaboration, you have somebody who is frustrating to deal with. Maybe you're the frustrating person. I'm sure I have been many times. I mean, Emily from Bi the Vile Smarts, right? She was labeled as the, the hard person. Um, 
how you show up, either as that person or as the one who's about to initiate the collaboration, is the very first step in collaborating with people that are tough. Um, can I call on you a little bit? I bumped into their, uh, I ran into their conversation. And um, she's management, and she was saying there's, there are a couple people who push all the time, right? They have a great idea, and she's able to navigate these um, in a way that doesn't necessarily you know, roll their eyes at the person, and it sounds like the people have no problem coming back to you again and again and again. One well, one specific. <laughs> but what would you say your magic is? Well, the person doesn't take it personally, you know, but it, and it's not maybe the first time. Yeah. How do you have to show up, though? You know somebody, whether it's that person or others. What do you do to get in a space where you can navigate whatever intensity is going to happen? She doesn't know, but that's OK. Think about it, because there's some kind of magic in there, right? Yeah. I don't work for her, but we work in the same area. Oh, they work in the same area, but not. He doesn't work for her, so he knows your magic. Well, she would be, yeah, right. She would have to be, or people wouldn't, they would know. Oh, yeah, approachable. Did you guys hear that? I'm going to lean this thingy without being awkward. Now, what did I say? <laughs> okay, um, in management, if you're approachable, a lot of good ideas will come to you. And that's where you learn a lot right. as a manager. No, you never claim all That's concerns. so cheap shot. This guy, this guy, that's all I can say. So, you don't work in his group. Mic drop. Drop the mic, this is over. Let's do the drawing. So what, what uh, she doesn't know that she does that, and I'm trying, I'm sorry to pick on you, but I'm not trying to, but it's a really great example, but your coworker knows that you're open. You're not confrontational. She still says no. Uh, that's what she said. She's like, no, we can't do that idea. No, I know that you love that idea. No, we can't do that idea. So it's not like her boundary changes at all. But she's still approachable, and she's open, and she listens, heavily boundaried, and so she gets all the good, juicy ideas. How is that not collaboration, right? Whether she likes it or not. She's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure out how to not do that anymore. Um, does that make sense to you? First, you find out, where am I out at? And am I approachable? That does not mean you get to take things out on me. It means I'll listen, but I'm still sticking with the next thing, which is the mission. How many of you understand when you're dealing with collaboration, in particular tough, tough collaboration, you want to go mission-centric? Because you can argue ideas into the ground, right? Everybody has an opinion. But it's the mission. Does that make sense? Does mission-centric make sense to you? So I did have a few, obviously, other activities planned. I don't think we're, I, again, did not um, plan for this many, and so I can't use them all. How many of you have heard of Turn the Ship Around by David Marquet? Okay, right. So what is it that you like about that book, or do you like that book? I like the whole idea of uh, having the command structure not just be the top, having input from the bottom up, because a lot of times the people at the bottom are the ones that actually know the problems you're dealing with. So different command structures. So there's a notion right now in DevOps, in DevOps, you can't, if you have one person or one discipline telling everybody what we're going to do, so this kind of goes into your question, not that you guys are, you're not. No, because it's the database question, because I can point at you, because you have a miniature schnauzer also. Um, so when you have one discipline telling everybody how the pipeline's going to be or how you're going to collaborate on DevOps, how does that go? Somebody just grunted over there. It was pretty funny. Yeah. That's you? You do that? How does it go? <laughs> it sucks. Right, so it sucks. What would be better? If you had your nirvana, what would it be? Instead of you having to push this onto everybody. 
Just dream really fast. It's okay. Trying to help people when they don't want to be helped. So that is when you want to say, can we collaborate on what this new thing is? So anytime you have one discipline or one person trying to push something, it's like pushing a noodle up the hill, right? So you don't want to do that. So you want to have a bunch of different people contributing and different voices. So how do you do that? Yes, Mr. Chestnut. Force this in the pipeline. I said, you'd rather have them embrace it because if you enforce it, it just leads to, uh, you know, I'm just going to do what you say. I'll do the minimum, and I, I'll be angry about it, and I'll just conform. And the minute that they get the chance, if they're angry and conforming, what are they going to do? Right, they're going to do whatever they want. They're going to be like, whatever, I'm out. So now what I want you to do is get back into those groups, knowing a little more who you are. And you've got a, someone who's joined you from behind. Uh, and talk about ways, so we're going to spin this up, we're all going to pretend for a minute, you have just this amazing intent, can you feel it in your bodies? Like, I have such great intent, and I'm starting, uh, I'm starting this conversation, we all want to talk, but we do have boundaries, because we have a mission. So I want you guys to get back into these groups and ask one another, uh, what are ways that if we were this kind of uh, organization, pretend you're an organization, how could we pull people into collaboration? What are some good ideas that's not manipulative, that is pure-hearted, and it's an invitation with a boundary? Does that make sense? This is hard. I'm killing this group back here. <laughs> I am killing you guys. I could even, just to help, we could even split you up just a little bit if you want. I'm saying that in the kindest of ways. So, because these are hard. These are wicked hard questions, right? These are hard. Would somebody adopt some of these guys into your, you know what? Oh, yeah, you guys come with, like, the, Sean Shelton should have just teach this. I don't even know why I'm teaching this. So go, go be with them. The dark side. Okay, everybody, does, that, does the question make sense? How could we invite people into collaboration that isn't manipulative, that allows them power, but allows us to get our stuff done? And then we'll talk through how, uh, some ways that you can do that. So on your market set, uh, flip around, collaborate. So fabulous, you guys are all chatting. Uh, he did. I'm sorry, what? That was so funny. <laughs> Hilarious. All right. Uh, how was that for you guys? Great. Why? Why was that great? We said a lot of things. <laughs> uh, well, one of the things that was pointed out is, uh, one is, we, we recently had a lot of meetings trying to accomplish a sp specific goal, but we didn't approach it as like, here's a solution, help me out. It was more like, hey, here's my problem, can you guys help me? So in other words, it was more of an inv uh, invitation for ideas rather than invitation for problem solving. I guess it's a little... Well, so that's, that's what we did do it differently, right? Instead of coming into the room and saying, here, this is the solution, let's get this thing implemented, we came into the room saying, here's our problem, help me fix it, right? So like, come up with some ideas to help me fix this problem rather than here's a solution, help me work it. Oh, I love it. So I don't know your name, but you smile a lot. So can, what's your name? Other side. Sean. Hey, so Sean, that's interesting. So what he said is, we came in with the problem. Because everybody has a solution, right? Like, everybody's like, you, you, you've got that, so I solved it, this is what the solved, but what, what problem were you trying to solve, right? And that's where in engineers, because I'm going to call everybody an engineer, I'm going to call all of you creative people. I'm going to call you makers, because you do make stuff, right? That's what we do, we make. Could be Pi, it could be, I don't know, Java, I don't know, whatever. But whatever it is, you're making, we are makers, we're creative. So when somebody comes to us and says, um, so I just made this habit. You like it, right? And you're like, for real? First of all, it doesn't even work with any of our systems. It's going to break everything. And like, where did you get this? Did you put this together in five minutes? He doesn't say that with his outside voice. But he thinks it, maybe. 
you're very nice. You look very nice. I can't imagine. And so when we come to one another uh, and we're trying to collaborate, is it collaboration or you just want a fan club? Oh, that's the best idea ever. You did such a great job. Why are you laughing? Has happened? It all happens, right? <laughs> and so it makes people crazy when you say, what is the problem we're trying to solve? So this guy, in turn your ship around, he got stuck with the worst nuclear ship in the entire Navy. Notice I said nuclear, so it's a little bit mission critical, right? And he was super bummed because he wasn't supposed to get that crappy ship. And it always ranked really low. And so he was like, great, I'm starting out my leadership with a crappy ship and a crappy crew. And he says that very, actually very nicely in the book. But uh, what's fascinating is how he chose to develop, first and foremost, self-awareness. He made a choice to lead differently, to collaborate differently. So the military does not do command and control anymore. They can't. They got their butts kicked. Um, by Saddam Hussein and by Al-Qaeda. And so they actually had to change based on that. There's a book called Team of Teams. Have any of you heard of that by General McChrystal Wright? They just had to change. So uh, I don't know why everybody else is still doing kind of command and control and uh, here's my solution, accept it. Really, how about you tell me the problem and then let's all collaborate and talk about what is the problem. That's mission central. That's mission centric. So that is one of the key ways to, to drive collaboration. First thing, what do I do? I figure out what my intent is. And frankly, if I want to manipulate the crap out of you just because I'm annoyed or don't have time, I typically make myself go for a walk. And sometimes it's triggers based on other things. Sometimes I ate too much sugar and I'm not feeling patient. But I have to get myself straight physiologically. Uh, or if I can't do that, and that has happened, because in the last two months I've literally flown from coast to coast every week. And sometimes I'm so jet lagged, I just say, you guys, I can't show up and sitting on the floor and I'm really tired, but here's the problem we have to solve. And I just keep saying, does it solve that problem? <laughs> so um, get yourself straight, then call everyone to the room and understand the problem. Sometimes I will say, here's the solution. I actually don't even know what I tried to solve. Can you guys figure out what problem I'm trying to solve? Have you ever backed into it like that? It's another way to find what the true problem is. Now, I'm a big Post-it note fan, although I love trees and I feel really bad when I kill them by using Post-it notes, so now I use virtual a lot. You can do a brainstorm activity, so these meetings don't take for one million years. And I have great books on facilitation, one called Collaboration Explained. And you can take these Post-it notes and brainstorm with people and do one per Post-it note. And then you don't let them talk because the yapping takes forever, right? I'm sorry, that's so rude, but it's the truth. And I say that, <laughs> she knows because she's been in my workshops and she'll be like, can we talk? No, no, we're not talking. Just stop. Just put the book, put the post-it notes on the wall, and then they do an affinity sort, and the and the talking goes down. But they see that they might have a trending behavior. But you can back into what problem are we trying to solve by saying these are the solutions we've come up with. Why did we do that? What were we doing? Then you check your math. Is that still the problem? So some of these cards, these are from some of them are from Alistair Coburn, again one of the original signers of the uh, Agile Manifesto. Um, and some of these are from Turn the Ship Around. They have something called dissent cards. If you can't dissent, what happens? If you cannot comfortably be that guy or that girl in the room, what do you think happens? Anybody? Why? Problems arise, why? People hide them. How easy is it? In Utah, we have a problem. We're known for it. Consultants actually know this secret. When you pe penny pinching, a little codo, that's what they say in Spanish, your little codo. Uh, that means cheap. Um, we have a funny cultural problem. Do, do, does any of you, do any of you know what that is? Conflict. We, won't be, we won't have conflict. We hate conflict. Uh, most companies, if you go to the HR, the problem they say that we have, we're very productive state, right? Beehive state, smart, highly educated. One of the highest educated groups in the United States, but we won't have conflict. We won't dissent. We're too nice. What a funny problem, huh? Too nice. So if your zipper is down, no one's going to tell you because we're too nice. We'd be like, doo doo doo, right? What's that? Oh, no. No, but when we're in our car, but that's the thing. She, you just said something genius. Obviously not on the freeway. Because we get angry. You have to take that out somewhere. So when I'm, there's an outlet. So when we're anonymous, 
we're like, boom, too bad. This is my lane. I'm not letting you merge. I hate merging in Utah, right? For those of you who are out of state, don't even try to merge. Just take a lift because we are not letting you merge because at, at work, right? He's like, oh, I'm from Boston. Oh, but honey, you don't know. <laughs> we are so passive aggressive. Okay, so you're okay. I thought I was going to have to give you a hug in the speakers lounge. Speakers lounge. He's a very aggressive person, so we're fine. Oh, I'm glad because I would not want to merge conflict with you. Did you see what I did there? Did you see? So um, that was a little developer humor, but I don't write code. <laughs> so <laughs> the funny thing is we will take our dissent out elsewhere, and that happens at work. How many of you have seen that where they won't conf write? Raise your hand high. How many of you have seen they won't have the conflict in the room? The conflict plays out outside the room, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So look around. You can quiet that. Do you know that uh, over 75% of all change efforts fail? You're talking about how do we make a change. They fail. Collaboration helps change and helps change not to fail. Why do collaboration effort or why do change efforts fail? People, it's not the plan. It's because they won't dissent. So dissent is super, super, super important. Being able to do what she does and entertain the dissent but still have a boundary. What's the mission? What problem are we solving? What she said to me over and over, because I was digging a little bit, she said, well, no, I just tell them that's a great idea. I understand you're passionate about this idea. Correct me if I'm wrong. But we can't do that right now. That's not where we're at. You know what she's saying? That's not the mission. That's not the problem we're trying to solve. You solved a fabulous problem. We're just not solving that problem today, right? <clears throat> so other things, other things that came out of your chit chat. Challenge. So, I would just use my outdoor voice. Uh, part of any solution has to be challenged to the idea. So part of the collaboration task or exercise also has to contain challenge to the ideas. Now that's not in a negative space like saying, oh, this idea sucks. If it does suck, why does it suck? And, and if why, what's, what can we do differently? Because if you don't have that challenge, you won't know the proper test effort for it. It might not be the right solution or the right path. And when everyone can agree that the idea has this problem or that problem, they usually come up with a better solution that will be right first time. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions about that little piece right there? So you can use the word challenge. So um, one of the things in, that Alistair, he actually, he, he wants people to have, to, to be able to have conflict or challenge or to dissent. He made little cards to keep by your desk. You're supposed to pick one up and practice it every day. Um, I love Alistair for that and for many reasons. He says, inquire, don't contradict. So my mother worked at the state mental hospital down in Provo for 26 years, and she would say something like, Help me understand how you got there. I, I can't get there. So it's not like Sean's wrong, right? I can't get there. I just, I'm not, I don't understand, but that could be me. How did you get there? And Sean might say something like, what would you say, Sean? Yeah. I just found myself here. I totally put you on the spot. So that's a different way to invite the conflict or the conversation, right? Or I may see somebody's eyeballs, because I have a weird eye, and I, I'm able to see um, even slight fluctuations in skin tone change. And so I can tell when people are a little sideways with what I've said, and I may say, I just saw that. There's something went through your head, and I'm talking a lot. Can you just, like, what went through your head? You can even be, be mean. Just tell me what it was. And I often will close my eyes and look away. I learned this from my dog. Because dogs will do this, right? Mammals, to, it's true. What is it? What, you tell me. You know dog behavior. What do they do when they, what does that mean? I'm letting you be in charge. And I do that with intent because it's less threatening than when I do this. So what were you saying? Huh? Right? It's like, oh. God, oh, you get out of my space. But if I go, I don't, I, help me get there. I'm really interested. I can tell I'm missing something. What is it? 
I'm, as a mammal, saying to him, I'm not threatening you, just say the scary thing. Yeah. Eye lines don't match. Turn a little bit. Right. So interestingly, so um, he and I know each other from another job, and he was just coming over to say he's going to have to bail out early. That's his way of saying, and he, I know why, and he's got a family thing. He's being very generous and saying, hey, I'm not leaving and being rude. But when he crouched down, if you noticed, he came in sideways, right? He did that without even without even probably thinking about it. But these are the ways for us to invite the harder conversation because you get the juice out of things. So what I want you to do now is turn back into that group, and this is going to be an interesting thing. I want you all to make up phrases. And don't You can be silly. I won't put a container on it. That you could use to invite someone to say what's challenging or dissentful, I, that's not a word, notably. Uh, like my mother, right? Help me understand. So you can't steal that one because that's Pamela's uh, that she got from training. But So turn to one another and just for fun, come up with different ways you could invite somebody to challenge the problem or challenge the situation or uh, make it safe for them. Does that make sense? This is hard, right? I'm not doing all the talking. All right, go. All right. So I'm going to quickly uh, pass the mic around a little bit. Phrases, right? Because how you say something. When I was first, so um, Sean just left, but he asked me, so how did you transition, Ollie? Because I was command and control project manager for about a decade. How did you transition? What did you do? Well, other than getting painfully self-aware about the baggage that I brought to the conversation, uh, neurologically, silently with my intent, my own safety issues that had nothing to do with work, that had to do with my own life and my own traumas, right? We all have them. It is what it is. You, and he, what he just said is you never know what anybody's going through, right? You just never, ever, ever know. And we all have a little bit of uh, software development PTSD, right? <laughs> you guys are like, she doesn't even have to ask, <laughs> right? I'm raising my hand. That's why we have EAPs. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, Jenny. Um, my parents are both therapy people, so mental health is just a part of my life. So I, sorry, I never, I'm, I don't know, I think I've had 20 therapists in my life starting at like six, because that's what we do in our family. It's like PT. Um, so uh, how you say things matters, and knowing how to anchor your words, because words matter, context matters, is how I started to change. So I actually had to literally write on Post-it notes the phrases and so before, so I'd get myself straight, right? Okay, here we go, game day, we're going to the playoffs. I had my agenda because I couldn't not do that, right? I'm like, hello. And then I'd open my book in there. I'd write it in Spanish because I'm really good with Spanish. I can write, read, and speak. And so I'd write it in Spanish because I didn't any want anyone to know what a dork I was. But I was focused. I was going to do this. And I would write my phrase, what I was going to use, and i put a dot on it every time I used my phrases. So I could keep track because I didn't want anybody being like, Alia, you didn't use the phrase you said you were going to use, right? <laughs> That's just weird. Um, and plus, I was a little fragile, so I wanted to keep track, but I wanted to hold myself accountable, so I had my post-it note. So these phrases matter. If you don't have a new phrase, you're going to use the old one. Trust me, you're going to get under stress. Everybody under stress does exactly what you didn't want to do, and you come out and you go, I ate the chocolate cake, and I wasn't going to. So phrases, I'm going to just go to each group. Let's see, really, so have your phrase ready. Anybody from here want to share like one phrase of how, what you would say? I'd say, tell me what I'm missing. Tell me what I'm missing. Thank you. Uh, tell me more. Tell me more. See, look how simple. Oh, tell me more. Right? But if you do it like this, tell me more. They're going to be like, ah. But if you, tell me more. Okay. So a uh, big one for us is what do you think, but engage the person's name. What do you think, Jade? Read up. How'd I do? But, and you have to really want to know, right? You can't be like, this person is so smart as a rock. They're going to tell me, and I'm going to be like, nope. So you, you, I'm assuming you're just like, tell me what you think, Jade. Oh, who knew? For reals. Let's play devil's advocate. Okay. So let's play 
devil, let's play devil's advocate. And then you would engage them to, you, you play devil's advocate. Like, help me. Help me come there. Got it. I like it. Uh, we w I would probably, I would say, you know what? I'm, I'm not understanding where you're at. Help me understand because I'm, I'm on a different page than you are and we're missing something. I like that. Sometimes I'll also say, in addition to that, this is really important to me and I'm on a totally different page and I don't want to be there. Can you flip it for me? Like, help me. Help me get there. So I think that that's just another way to, to say that exact thing. Yeah, we have a couple, but. I think you're like the PDA in two areas. Like, you're like out with too much stress. <laughs> she knows. <laughs> um, so if I'm hearing or understanding you correctly, and then just repeat what they said. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. If I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, if I understand, check my math, how to do, kind of a thing. Yeah, I like that. So. So for us, I don't know if we really came up with a phrase, but we found that um, a way that you can really help engage people and pull them out is by starting out with a compliment. You know, we point out something that they've really done that benefited in the past, and that you use that to pull them into um, getting their feedback. Okay. So yeah, I could totally see that with somebody super reticent. You would say, I, I really appreciated the feedback the other day. That really worked. Thank you so much. Like, help me with this or something like that. Kind of a... You did a great job solving that in the past. Like, let's look at this one now. Okay, got it. Other contributions? Yeah, she's like, no, no, I got this lady. Ah, <laughs> uh, shouldn't have worn the shirt. Apparently, um, what did we come up with, guys? We, we talked about a lot of things, but I don't know. We came up like one thing. So one I threw out there was similar to the first one of the first groups where just. That's interesting. Tell me more about that until you kind of drive to the points that a lot of times people kind of come to some of the points on their own when they're just explaining what their thought process more. What's that? Yeah. Well, that's a little doubting. We'll just we'll skip that one. Okay. What about next group? Is this helpful, you guys? Write these down. These are these are like little magic bullets for if you you say I want to collaborate with the people who are hard to collaborate. You can't tell them, right, because they're already a challenge. So you've got to go into that understanding mode and see, do they understand that mission? So here, yes. So lots of times I'll try to start by reminding, okay, we both have the same goal here. We both want maybe what's best for the company or, you know, the, to solve this problem. And then I'll say, so, you know, can we agree that that's where we're starting from. And, and, and depending on the history, it might even go, okay, well, and then this happened and this happened, you know, can we agree that that's the same? And then be like, okay, now I feel like there were some differences here. Can you tell me about your perspective? So that's a really, like almost skipping ahead to the next piece approach, which is sometimes you're trying to understand something and the thing is you're under you're misunderstanding at the very most fundamental level which is what problem are we solving so help me understand more so are we still aligned to this thing is this what we're talking about okay now help me dig in and understand that perfect um we just came up with is there anything i said that you don't agree with okay is there anything you i said that you don't agree with sometimes a negative bias can help right it can help for sure uh There's no sacred cows here. Oh, cute. There are no sacred cows. Slaughter the cows, but save the polar bears. I like that, right? There's no sacred cows where you're saying, no, it's okay to challenge, it's cool. Uh, yes. One of ours was, uh, can you draw a picture for me? thought of that can you draw that out for me like that is really like physically
Did you guys hear all that? I had literally never thought of that. I'm going to go get a book for myself. That's my aha. Uh -huh. Just kidding. I have enough books. That's really cool, right? He's laughing. I'm funny. All right, next group. Um, so one of the things I was thinking of is you're presenting, you're presenting a, a, a solution to a, a, an issue. So you could provide things like, what challenges do you see and how would you approach them? Or what are your thoughts? How would you approach this, right? You're inviting dissent. How would you approach this? What are your thoughts? That's really, really great. And I think we went around the room. So inviting dissent, right? Utah, we're too nice. So I'm straight with myself. I know my intent. I know the mission. And we have these great phrases. If you want, take a second. I mean, I know I'm not using the post-it notes much, and I'm sorry about that. Um, but write down these phrases. These are the phrases that invite the conversation. Now, what are we dissenting, dissenting about? So I'll just tell you, while I was on the floor checking, the team, the company that I'm engaged with right now, like I said, they were going to lose their funding. They had to deliver something quite literally yesterday. And today, they had to demo to their funder. So I got, I uh, just an hour ago, literally got a message from the CTO saying, we're sorry you couldn't be there. Demo went off amazingly. I can't, you know, we couldn't think, we couldn't do it without you. We didn't think we could do it. And they kind of couldn't. But you know what I did? I'm so naughty because what I kept saying is they would say, we could do this and this and this. And, and the developers would be like, oh, yeah, don't worry about it. If you want to refactor that along the way. So this is right after stand-up, right? I had five different teams I was running. We could refactor this and this. I said, hey, you guys, so it sounds like we have a little bit of a change from, uh, from the scope, which is perfectly fine, but will it help us meet May 15th? Like, it's your nights and weekends. It doesn't bother me. I won't be there with you on the nights and weekends, but do you want to actually do that? So, you know, I put them in a bit of a shoebox. I kind of made them do a certain thing, but I did give them some latitude as to whether or not they wanted to work nights and weekends just so that they could gold plate a couple things. And they knew they were gold plating, and they were like, no, maybe not. And I kept saying, are we on track for May 15th? And then I would get really specific with the details. So May 15th, 5 p.m. Pacific time. Because you all know, we're all you know, engineers. We're going to be like, well, it was, you didn't say what time. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right? Well, and then, well, we have a New York office and an Australia office. And uh, then we have the one in San Francisco. So which? Which time zone also were you, like, we thought you meant uh, actually a different time zone. That's why we didn't finish at that time. And I knew this was going to go down. So it was like Pacific Daylight Time, May 15th, 5 p.m. 5.01, it means it's late. And they would be like, <laughs> the C-suite was like, why are you being so specific? I'm saying, because that's the mission. That's the mission. Well, what, what environment does it have to be in? OK, let me be clear. It has to be in, and I had no idea, so I'd be like, what environment is it reasonable to be in? And then they would say, this environment. And I would literally type it and project it, because it was all Zoom meetings, because I have people in Ottawa as well. And I would say, word for word, do you guys agree with that? Did I write any word wrong? And they would say, no, you got that right. So then I would just say, OK, according to what you all said, this is every stand-up for the last three weeks. In this environment, in this place, pushed at this time, with these scripts, right? Like with the candle, in the ballroom, by Scarlet, right? You can't, you don't win clue if you only get two of the clues, right? You don't win. You just got some of it. And so knowing the mission is how in turn the, the ship around. It's how he turned that ship around. And what you end up doing is lowering your social position from me being the weird up, upper echelon person. Are you nodding? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just walk the mic over. Why, what makes you nod? Just what you said. You, re rel you relinquish your position of power and, and give it away. And then people are free to contribute. Kay. So did you guys hear that? Because he was a little bit quiet. You relinquish your position of power so people are free to contribute. When you are talking about the people that are a challenge, to collaborate with, or 
if you are challenged, because I'm a challenge sometimes to collaborate with two, I have to clarify the mission. Because I'm going to be a dog with a bone, right? I'm very persistent, even at my young age of 25. There's an ongoing joke about this, by the way. I know I'm not 25. I totally get it. So I'm very persistent. My whole family is. That's why my sister SWAT. Like, she's never going to give up, right? It's just the best. She is who she is. So you need to know the mission. So if you are the dissenter or the hard one to collaborate with, just make sure you're right on the mission. Is this the mission? Help me understand, right? You can do the same, use the same things. Can you draw the mission for me? Can you write it down? Because I, so I might, one of my phrases is, I might be on crack. So I'm sorry about that. Now, I'm not on crack. First of all, I'm not skinny enough. Second of all, my teeth are really good and my, my skin's really nice. So I'm clearly not on drugs. I qualify that just because I don't want people to be like, she's, you know, she's on stage, but she's, she's doing blow. I'm not. I don't ever, I have allergies. So, <laughs> oh, that's so bad. I, I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> no, seriously. She, you know what my sister said once, and then I'll go right back to what we're talking about. She said, just so you know, I'm never going to go easy on you. If I pull you over and it's you, you're getting the ticket. And I'm like, you're me. Like, you're my freaking sister. No, I'm a police officer first. I'm like, oh, God, you need alcohol. <laughs> but don't drink and drive. <laughs> right, right. Just eat your donut and be quiet. Uh, <laughs> so mean to that police officer sister of mine. No, I do love her. But the thing is, mission, 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 right? Even if I am the one who is going to insert the challenge in collaboration, I'm going to get myself centered. I'm going to know what my intent is. Am I afraid? Is this triggering, whether you like it or not, your family of origin issues come up, right? They do. And I actually know this uh, in a painful way because when I first was introduced to Agile, I had a fabulous Jungian therapist. I told you I have like over 20. We just, we do that like you go grocery shopping in our house. So, and I still love this guy. He's great. And he said I was explaining Agile to him. It was new, 2008. And I was like, this is Agile. And he goes, whoa, this is group work. Are you people qualified? I was like, what are you talking about? And so he's telling me how this is like group work, right? If you don't know what that is, Google it, group therapy. And I was like, no, I'm not prepared to do this. So he said family of origin issues are going to come up. And that was interesting. So my own, I have to check, OK, how am I doing? Are my family of origin issues are up? Should I check that at the door? Am I OK? Back up. All right, what's the mission, Alia? You know, dog with a bone. Don't be a dog with a bone. So always clarifying the mission for others allows them to dissent easier, because at least then you're dissenting on the thing that you wanted to dissent on, right? Very, very important. So mission clarity. So one thing that, uh, and it lowers your social position, and it creates a cool phenomenon. Sean, before he left, asked me what made the magic. What was the big game changer? The big game changer for me is when we're all, is that my phone that's dinging? Okay, okay, that's okay. If it's mine, I would want it to stop, but yours is fine with me. Um, so you create what's called leader, leader. Leader, leader. Raise your hand if you know what that means. Okay, what does it mean? Sorry, Bill, now I'm picking on you again. It's shared equally. You, you don't have to do a whole lot as a leader. So if you want to do like a mic drop and not have to do, excuse me, as much, I'm checking the time, you want everyone to understand the mission, help them to know how to keep track of themselves, and then eventually, usually, oddly enough, the timing is about three months for me. If I've done it right, after three months, I don't actually have to attend any meetings, and they all just do them. I schedule them maybe spin up what they're supposed to talk about, and then I'm done. I don't have to go anymore. And people say, why don't you have to go? And I said, because they lead it. I literally don't even have to talk. I'm bored out of my mind, and then I'm, I'm a distraction because I'm bored, and then I want to play, and then I'm a problem. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What makes you say yes? Think, well, don't, no, I'm not saying that. No, okay. He, he, hasn't, he hasn't worked with me. But yes, I, will st I mean, I'll start to play because I have nothing to do as a leader because now you're a leader. We co-own it. So in his book, and I would recommend you guys get it, is 
he says, uh, he knew he'd done the right thing. They were about to pivot. They were in a channel. Okay, this is a nuclear sub, right? Not gas or wood fire burning or steam. They were going to pivot. And uh, there's a potential that they could hit another ship. They could have a crack. They could leak nuclear stuff. Very bad. And like the lowest level dude, so he, you know, uh, the captain, David Marquette, was like, charge straight ahead. And one of the lowest level dudes said, belay that order. Right? Belay. And he said, and God bless him for being so transparent, he was like, he was immediately triggered, like, really? But he'd been working on this leader, leader behavior for so long, he was like, okay, it's okay, it's okay, this is what I trained him. And he said, you know, he asked for context what was happening. Well, what David Marquet didn't know is that he had gotten a little turned around as the captain, and what he had said is to go a direction and crash the ship. And had they done it without this person saying belay, they would have crashed and they would have had a nuclear incident. That's leader, leader. Leader, leader is lowering. Everyone knows the mission. Everyone owns the mission. May 15th, 5 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. In this environment, these things have to be done. If this is here on the JIRA board, it means it's done. It doesn't mean dev done. It doesn't mean ready for a pull request. It means your QA, who is the Pope, in this moment, said, it's done. And it deployed with the scripts you wrote to the environment you all said it should be in. That, at 5 p.m., May 15th, Pacific time, <laughs> means it's done. But then I could walk away. You guys, I haven't even checked in in three days. And they were like, how could you do that? I'm like, because they all know what they're doing. Plus, it's on Confluence. <laughs> so, but that's important, right? Making it available. So mission mission-centric. Um, so again, if you want to have the people that are frustrating to collaborate with uh, become your leader, help them understand the mission. So I'm trying to think. There's one other thing. So one other thing is how we talk. So I'm going to address one of the questions over here. And then I think I'm going to be probably done. I might end just a, a wee bit early. Team agreements. That's good. Oh, no, you don't. We have to, don't have to. We, we're just doing drawings next, so we can just leave them, and the people will come and stack them. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's not going to be very long. <laughs> but team agreements. Team agreements. Why do you think after you're straight as a, as a, as a leader, you've got everything uh, going on in your head, you're using the right words, they know the mission, you're inviting dissent, why are team agreements important? Yes, sir. There was an old saying about a general, and he said, um, I, I don't know what general said it, but he said, uh, if your men fear you, they'll follow your orders, but if they love you, they'll save your life. And people, when they have buy-in, when, when you have that team buy-in like you're talking about, you'll get more passion out of the team, which means better quality work than you will, like we talked about earlier, where they'll just do the bare minimum they have to to have followed your orders. Yeah, so very true. Ownership, giving them team ownership is very, very important. I had a phenomenon at the, not this place I'm at, but the place before where everybody thought they were right, and we literally, to groom a story, was one story, and I'm talking like should have been a three-point story, would be an hour and 15 minutes. And it was all about how I can get you to think that I'm the one who's right. And oh my gosh, if I wanted to stab my eyes out. Okay, how... Oh my gosh, right? Well, first of all, have you guys ever experienced that where you're like, oh my gosh, shut up, right? I know you're smart, but my goodness, like here's your prize. Can we go to bed now? Um, and that's not the first place. It was this place and the one before. And so I began to think about when people have to be right for whatever the reason, what do I do, right? It is terrible. It makes you want to stab your eyes out. Don't do that. Don't try it at home. So the question I have is, if you don't agree with people, it's super easy to collaborate when there's affinity, right? If we're all dog lovers and we're going to do a dog thing, then we're fine. But what if there's no affinity? And I have noticed regional differences in how we have dissent, conversation, who gets to be right. So I notice uh, each region in the United States is a little bit different and throughout the world. And as we become a more remote and global um, community of developers and DevOps peoples, now we have all these cultures 
about who gets to be right and wrong and who should have the most influence and who should talk and who should shut their mouths, right? So now what do I do? And I sat and I thought and I thought. And then again, that's when I was like collaborating with the enemy. Thank you, Adam Kahane, and a book called Power and Love, which is all about social change. And I realized we have to have some social change in our own work environments. I originally named this social change in the workplace, but then I changed it because I thought eating kale was a much more compelling title, um, obviously. So how do you create a new culture? So this is the final thing I want to talk about, because when you're talking about challenging collaboration, not affinity where we're all the same meetup and we love Kubernetes, yay, fangirl. No, what if I don't actually want to collaborate with you? What if the way you breathe, the way you say the word the is on my last nerve, right? It happens, but what do I do? How do we, I think you should be in my culture, because I'm, my culture is right. And that is literally, basically, the fights that I saw at my last place. Hours, hours, we never delivered, we never even got started. So, what could you do to create a brand new culture? So I'm gonna give you about five minutes, or maybe 10, Just go back and, he's like, oh, oh, you're, you're killing me. I'll give you the answer. That's just lame, though. You guys are smarter than I am. So turn to one another. I propose you need an entirely new culture that's owned by that group. How would you do that? I am going to call us back. Um, he's got a good idea. I'm going to let him finish. So I'm being told <laughs> that they are standing at the door to not let people in. So let's just take a couple of, of your own conversations, right? Because we want to share these out. Um, I'm certainly no expert, but you guys are collectively. So a couple of ideas. Just raise your hand if you guys want to share something you came up with. No one wants to share. Oh, thank you. This may not be the right answer. Uh, I Just to give the full context, uh, my father passed away about 15 years ago. And I had a conversation with my mom a week or two later. And she was telling me how hard it is because my dad would always come up with the ideas and she would always fix them. And, and now she has to come up with the ideas. And so I was like, I was just thinking about the situation of a room where everybody wants to be right. Ultimately, somebody is responsible for that project and that person just needs to shut everyone down and say, okay, here's the answer and then let them become, the, he becomes the common enemy or she and then let them fix the problem and say, okay, it's not, I'm right, you're wrong, it's, this is wrong, we're all gonna fix it together. And that was the one idea I had that is trying to get everyone on the same page um, if they're not in agreement. Okay, very nice. So sometimes you just, like consensus, right? Do you guys know, like, let's say that saying, like death by consensus or something like that. Consensus de decision making takes forever and most of us don't have uh, the money or the time or in some cases, the patients or Diet Coke to handle consensus-driven uh, behavior. And so you do, here's some of the solutions. I'm gonna jump ahead, and if someone else wants to share, raise your hand, but I'm literally being told that they are blocking people from coming in. So um, we will definitely end up a little early. S the drug. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Just kidding, no, I can't, but I'm gonna give away some of the books to you guys, because you guys came. So be thinking. Um, roles and responsibilities, right? Sometimes being disingenuous that you let people think that they actually have influence when they actually don't will shut them down. They'll just not participate eventually. But being very clear that I'm trying to get some better ideas or I'm trying to find the problem or I'm trying to solve the problem, be very clear about what the decisions are. And that's part of what I had to do. Here are the roles and responsibilities. This person is the architect. It is what it is. But we're gonna have 10 minutes of input of risk mitigation. This is your role. So what I said is your role in this participation is to tell us where any dead bodies are in the code. It is to mitigate any risk. So now go. And so helping people to understand what their role and responsibility is within the conversation and time boxing it is very, very important. So when it comes to that uh, and I also very calmly, because it is my brand, called out, you guys, do you notice that we just sit and argue about who's right? Is there a way for us to redirect ourselves? So we actually did an exercise and came up with phrases we could say to help 
to gently help redirect one another when we were rat holing or if it was not our role and responsibility. And I'll tell you, it was so generous, it shocked me. And so there are ways to begin to reshape the conversation. The other one is team agreements. And those phrases became team agreements. And I would say, how, is, how are our team agreements? It would be like this, no backstabbing, because my goodness, if they did not backbite. And it was like a team of your regular demographic. And it was a full stack team, notably. And they would backbite like nasty. And so I would say, OK, because <laughs> this is my brand. I said, y'all know you, every single one of you complain to each other about each other, right? We all know that. And it's really yucky. And you all know people are talking about you. So what do we do, you guys? Because you all know you don't like that, but you also really like each other. So how do we change this? And the interesting thing is I had one engineer who said, you know, I do that a lot when I get frustrated. I'm not good at one-on-one -on -one con uh, one -on -one conflict. So I think, can we write a team agreement just for me? Which you know it wasn't just for him, right? A team agreement just for me that says I have to go one-on-one -on -one to people. So I said, well, do you want to do that via Slack or a phone? Like, what do you want me to specify for you? Because I, um, I know that he was doing it for all of us. He was taking the hit, right? Because that's the kind of guy he was. And he said, how about we do a phone call, maybe like a Slack face phone call? That's a little more gentle. And I said, well, are there words you want to say? He said, yeah, I think what I want to do is say that I might be wrong in misunderstanding. I kind of want to start off. I said, well, is there a phrase you want to use? And so I typed it, and they all agreed. And that was the beginning of our team agreements. And right, Adam Kahane, the way he gets drug lords to stop killing one another is to say, you know, do we really want to shoot each other and kill each other for things we said in safety? How do we create safety that extends outside of the room in those conversations? And it's team agreements. And those are all over the internet. I could spend hours on that. Totally ridiculous waste of your time. So collaborating with those who you don't want to collaborate with, being the one the people maybe don't want to collaborate with. I've gone over those multiple times intentionally so you remember them. You get straight with your intent, with what's going on in your body. You look at the mission. Do you understand the mission? Do you know good phrases? I'm, I, I'm going to dissent here. Help me understand if I'm wrong. Do I have the right mission? Could we make some agreements to form a new culture? What Kahane did, what every team does who forms team agreements, and if you don't use them, look at using them, you create a brand new culture that's that team. That's that team. You even create nomenclature, ways of behaving. Then you play together. And you begin to have little funny inside jokes. Maybe you're called the unicorn or whatever. Like the DevOps guys have a million little names for me. But that's our little funny culture. It allows us, when it gets tense over these two days, to just navigate generously. That is the end of the workshop. I really hope that it was useful to you. Thank you all for playing and attending. <laughs>